you better believe this is Spirit of the Beehive. I don't know. What are your plans typically for Halloween? Um, usually just have like my closest friends over, friends slash cousins, and uh, we watch a movie. A scary movie? No. What? Very PG. We're all scaredy cats. Wait, you have your friends over on Halloween and you watch some PG. We're going to watch Coco this year. Wait. Well, I guess. (laughs) Okay. I mean, I guess that's kind of fits in. Yeah. We love it. I don't know. Oh my God. <laughs> Remind me not to go over your house for Halloween. Please don't. You're not welcome. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? What do you usually do? I watch a double feature usually. It changes every year. Usually one is like pretty grimy and crazy, and then the other one's like a classic black and white horror movie. Wow, that's nice. Yeah. Do, what do you, do you have, like, you do this alone or you do with friends? Um, I usually keep it pretty low key. Nice. The night of Halloween. Yeah, yeah, night of. Yeah. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Stepped on you. No, good. Do you have any Halloween themed food or drink? Uh, I don't go that far. I don't, I mean, I'll have like, I'm actually really into the monster cereal. Oh my God. Booberry? Booberry, Chocula. Blueberries. This year they actually brought back Fruit Brute, which had been gone for a long time. It's the mummy. Oh no, sorry, it, that's that's a different one. It's the the werewolf, but Ooh. it's essentially Frankenberry. It tastes just like Frankenberry. What's so. the difference between Frankenberry? I I always get blueberry. What's Frankenberry? Frankenberry is strawberry. <gasps> oh yeah. Yeah, I like blueberry and chocula. Those are my favorites. How fun! Yeah, yeah I do like pigs in a blanket mummies. Like oh dogs. really? Yeah. Oh, well, and maybe I always you make want to come cider. over. Yeah, we have a lovely time. I always make cider, like hot cider. But wait, I'm sorry, but you cannot <laughs> just watch Coco on Halloween night. I'm sorry. I'm Why? sorry. You can't. <laughs> we like it. Ugh. We do Corpse Bride sometimes. Oh, boy. We do, I hate to break it to you, but Hocus Pocus. Well, that one's a little more, yeah, all right. What's like the scariest one we do? <laughs> Maybe like Edward Scissor. <laughs> that's like that's not scary. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, we do. We have a, we have a good time. Hey everybody, welcome to Seen and Heard. This is the podcast where two entertainment assistants talk about the sight and sound top one hundred greatest films of all time list. We're back this week. Uh, what number is this on the list? Eighty one. Eighty one. Okay, so we're eighty one because we do ping pong back and forth between the top and the bottom of the list, working our way towards the center. And this week, we're at number 81. It's Victor Eurice's The Spirit of the Beehive. Also, just to reiterate, we are taking the month of November off. Uh, We will both be taking a break, so there will be no seen and heard in November. Hmm. But I promise, I swear, we're going to be back in December, on December 6th, which is the first Tuesday in December, with none other than Singing in the Rain. (gasps) Yay. So yeah, we both write, we both are creative we're both busy we're doing stuff so we figured that a month off would not be the worst thing in the world so we're not going to be here november but the arroyo film club does have a brand new podcast premiering november 3rd so we are proud to present a brand new podcast called behind the slate in which aaron strand who's a, a good friend of both of ours as a host goes through the lives and and biographies of filmmakers. So he'll start, he's doing a series on Charlie Chaplin. So his first couple episodes will be on the life of Chaplin, literally taking you from his birth to his death. And he has many more exciting filmmakers in store. So November 3rd, we will be debuting in the, in the absence of Seen and Heard, a brand new podcast called Behind the Slate. So exciting. Yeah, it's going to be great. Aaron does a great job. It's oh, I'm fantastic. really, really excited for it. And then we'll be back as seen and heard December 6th. Can't wait. Hi, Jackie. Hi. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy almost Halloween. Yes. Well, while you're enjoying your uh, your cocoa 
And your, hey, uh, it's spiked cider, okay? Edward Scissorhands. See, to me, Edward Scissorhands is a Christmas movie. It's both to me in the same way that like Nightmare Before Christmas is yeah, both. Yeah, but there's nothing Halloween-y about Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> it's just eerie. We do Beetlejuice eerie. sometimes. Yeah, Beetlejuice works, but Edward Scissorhands isn't eerie. Besides the he, castle. He's eerie. No, he's just a big sweetheart. I, don't get me wrong. I love Edward Scissorhands. I think it's incredible. But it's a Christmas movie. Come on. I mean. I see it as both. Okay, well. Okay, agree to disagree. <laughs> what else do I like to watch? Well, I just watched Fantastic Mr. Fox. That is what I've been watching. It's a fall movie, yeah. It's okay. a fall movie. Cool. Yeah, um, let's get into uh, what you've been watching. <laughs> just that. Just that? <laughs> that, I did watch The Silence, Bergman's The Silence. Big Bergman mood lately? Yeah, I have been in a big Bergman mood. Always. Um, it's really good. It's so different from the other two in the series, Through a Glass Darkly and Winter Light, because it's very uh, like abstract and, you know, it's, it's not about the theme, the silence of God at all, really, but it's part of this trilogy. I mean, you can read into it. That's one way to read into it, but it is very much like an impressionistic, um, chamber piece, really. And it's it's interesting because it's not exactly a cha- it's a chamber piece because it all takes place in like one hotel, but I think it's the Bergman movie I've seen with the least amount of dialogue. It's called The Silence for a reason. Like they barely talk, hmm. which is really interesting. Yeah, I that that's really high on my list. I should have seen it by now, but I haven't. It's good. You like it? It's very obscene. Really? Yeah. The more obscene, the better. I know. <laughs> What have you been watching? <laughs> um, not not that much either. Uh, I recently watched Evil Dead Two because I've been watching the uh, the Ash versus Evil Dead series that was on Stars a few years back, mm-hmm, and I uh, it's fun. It's a good time, but uh, yeah, made me want to go back. And Molly, I was watching it. And Molly's like, "What? It, like, is this based on something?" I'm like, "Yeah, it's based on the Evil Dead movies." And she like had this glazed look in her face. I was like, "Okay." So, so I sat her down. We skipped Evil Dead 1 because I feel like, you know, don't get me wrong. I like Evil Dead 1. I grew up on Evil Dead 1. But like, at a, you know, it's it's not a great one to like show people if they're not like huge horror fans. So we started with Evil Dead 2. And the intention of, is doing Army of Darkness, uh, the follow up before Halloween. But yeah, it, of course, it wasn't really her thing. Uh, but it's to me, it is a near masterpiece. And obviously, I'm not alone in that thought. Is it one of, probably one of the biggest cult classics of all time? But yes, Evil Dead Two is a piece of just pure filmmaking, just a piece of genius. So that's basically all I've been watching. Wow, you've been like really strict with your horror movies. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, you know what I really want to watch? I might watch it tonight, later tonight. Vampire by... Uh, Dreyer? Yeah, Dreyer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, Greg? What? I'd be curious to see... I'd be curious to see what you thought. I don't love it. I think it has some really cool stuff in there, but it's not like... It's not like incredible. It kind of has... Because it's like an early sound movie, so it kind of has like some growing pains. Like it's I've not it Passion like, of Joan of Arc. It's, it has like dialogue and... Um, silent stretches, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's really cool stuff in there, but yeah, to give, it a, give it a watch. It's worth watching. Well, speaking of old horror movies and the influence they have on us, should we get into this week's movie? Let's do it. From 1973... This is Victor Arise's The Spirit of the Beehive. Spirit of the Beehive was released in Spain in 1973. 
It was directed by Victor Erise, co-written by Erise and Angel Fernandez Santos. Cinematography by Luis Cuadrado. Music by Luis de Pablo. Set in 1940, the film tells the story of a little girl, Anna, living in the newly instated fascist regime in Spain. Her family is comprised of her sister, Isabel, her melancholy mother, Teresa, and her father, Fernando, a scholar slash beekeeper. One day, her and Isabel go to the village to see a traveling cinema, and they watch the 1930 film Frankenstein in terror and wonder. Anna is deeply affected by the movie, and Isabel tells her that the spirit of Frankenstein's monster is alive and well, and can talk to her if she wants to. She frequents an abandoned house that Isabel says the monster lives in, and eventually she finds a leftist fugitive taking shelter in the house. Anna brings him her father's old coat, but eventually he is caught and killed, with the coat and the watch inside of it being traced back to Anna's family. Anna decides to escape into her world of fantasy, running away from home and encountering the monster by a lake. She is eventually found, but a doctor warns her mother that she has been through a trauma and will retreat into herself until she recovers. The film closes with Anna calling out to her spirit one last time. The four main characters all share the name of the actor playing them. What happened was, apparently the actress who plays Anna couldn't remember the names or couldn't understand why they had different names. So Arisa decided to just name them all after the actors. So the film stars Fernando Fernan Gomez as the father, Teresa Gimpera as Teresa the mother, Anna Torrent as Anna, and Isabel Telleria as Isabel. The film was shot on location. The house is a real house, and it is one of the first Spanish films where dialogue was recorded on set, not dubbed in post. And also, it was one of, or I think it was the first time that the children's voices were actually used. So prior to this, they would use like women doing a shrill high voice yeah. for children. But this was one of the first times that the chi- the children's voices are actually used, which is so great. Like I can't imagine hearing a fake child's voice, but a lot of people complained that they couldn't understand. Um, despite its anti-fascist implications, the film won the top prize at the San Sebastian Film Festival But the audience didn't really like it. Some people booed and stomped their feet when the film won. It had its U.S. premiere at the Chicago Film Festival in November of 1973. It played at Cannes in 1974. And it was released in New York in 1976. And then there was a re-release in 2006. And the film is part of this kind of new wave of Spanish filmmaking that happened towards the end of the Franco regime, which ended in 1975 when he died. Uh, filmmakers like Erice and most famously Carlos Sara were inspired by Buñuel because Buñuel returned to Spain in 1962. He hadn't been there since the Civil War. And he made his first movie since then. And it's called uh, Viridiana. I've never seen it. But it's apparently a critique of the church, like a scathing critique. Again, I haven't seen it, but knowing Buñuel, it's probably far from straightforward and so he got away with it before the censors caught on it was only when they like heard what people outside of spain were saying about it and interpreting it when they realized that it was a critique of the church but he had already like gotten out of there by then so but it really started a movement of very subtly through impressionism making films in spain political again or at least have political implications And nearing the end of the dictator's death, the country had become more lenient anyway, so it kind of worked out. And Victor Erice has only made three feature films, this being his first. He made two more. One of them is called El Sur, which he made in 1982, which is similarly themed. It's about a little girl in this post-Civil War War Spain. And he also made The Quince Tree Sun in 1992, which is this mix of narrative and documentary about a painter. And apparently he does have a new feature in development. Really? Yeah. Uh, And it was announced like in 2022 that he is working on something. So we'll see. I didn't know that. He's made a bunch of shorts, like a lot of shorts. Okay. But it's just funny that you make like one of the most iconic Spanish movies of all time and then you make two more features and then you just make shorts. Like it's like a reverse career. Well, what can I say, Jackie? The uh, traditional path is not for everybody. I love it. 
it. I think it's so cool, but sad because I feel like he's so great. Have you seen El Sur? No, have you? Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. And yeah, it's very similar in tone to this movie. But the whole movie, they're kind of talking about this like magical land, this other place, the South. And originally there was supposed to be like half the movie is them like about like talking about it. And the second half of the movie is them there. And they never shot the whole second part of the movie. So it's this weird, almost like unfinished film. Um, Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, what are your also? Initial- I like that you said the monster instead of Frankenstein because well, duh. it's insane how many people get like? that wrong. <laughs> so many people get it wrong. <laughs> initial thoughts. My initial thoughts are: Wow, look at all that honey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Winnie the Pooh. Uh, yeah. I, so I'd seen this before. I actually saw it for the first time about a year ago. We did it for the film club. Uh, and I think it was an October pick. It was either September or October to kind of coincide. I'm, I, I could be wrong. Maybe it was, but we did it about a year ago. And uh, yeah, it's, um, I'd been meaning to see it for a long time because like everyone on this planet, I'm a huge fan of Pan's Labyrinth and uh, Devil's Backbone and stuff. And you always hear about how Del Toro was so influenced by Spirit of the Beehive. And so it loomed large for many a year. And uh so yeah, I saw this with the film club about a year ago. And yeah, I I like the movie. I think it's uh I can especially imagine for the time like kind of unlike anything else. And still to, by today's standards, there's not that much even with the ties to Guillermo del Toro. Like yeah. this stands on its own as just its own thing. And uh yeah, I like this movie a lot. I think it's it's not a movie I'm going to like die for. You know, it's not Fanny and Alexander, but not every movie needs to be Fanny and Alexander. But no, I, I think it's a, a really impressive piece of work. And it's just something that's very nuanced. I just love the sort of like delicate, how delicately observed it is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it deals with a lot of themes that I'm interested in. And just the way in which the story is told is uh, something that it's a way that appeals to me. So yeah, I like I like it a lot. Do you? Do you like uh, El Sur more? Good question. I'd have to see El Sur again. It's been a couple years, so I would need to watch it again. I, I like them both like quite a bit. But yeah, this this uh, this checks the boxes for me. How about you? Yeah, I live for movies like this, like about kids, but not for kids. I think... Yeah, we just talked about that when we did Fanny and Alexander. Yeah. This is a really beautiful, atmospheric movie that's at once so unsentimental but also deeply full of like sweeping emotions and i respect that so much like how you keep it unsentimental when you have all these people feeling so much i love that it tricks you in the beginning like the credits with all the kids drawings and the last one is a screen it's so cute and the music is so whimsical it sounds like a medieval fairy tale and it even it starts with once upon a time it's whimsical but there's also like a there's a minor key to it there it sounds like a little I unsettling love it. you know what the opening credits reminded me of reminded me of to kill a mockingbird yes credits. totally the song even yeah yeah um I love the quietness, especially with the family, to a point where it's like frustrating, but that's the point, you know? And I also love that no secrets are revealed. Like, who, who is the mom writing to? What, what does dad really do? You know, like, I love how these are left unanswered. And yeah, I, I love Pan's Labyrinth. I really, really love Pan's Labyrinth. And, but they're, they're very different. Pan is like a direct allegory about blind loyalty and fascism and where this is more like it's like a meditation on death and destruction itself through the experience of this girl and yeah i like, don't yeah it's a much subtler fantasy everyone world. always makes it seem like oh like this is where pan's labyrinth came from and it's like it's directly inspired by it but like no they're super different yeah i think pe- those people aren't giving del toro enough credit i think too because yeah, the the fantasy world of this is much subtler. So like the different. the fantasy world is abandoned farmhouses, where the fantasy world of Pan's Labyrinth is, is a fantasy world, is a literal fantasy world with fairies and big frogs that live in trees and stuff. Yeah, I love that movie. It's so good. I know it really is. <laughs> I remember I saw. I worked in a movie theater when that came out, and we used to have to do these things called dry runs, where you would because it was still on film, so you would check the print. Uh, to make sure that the print looked okay before the movie would officially open. 
So that night I volunteered to do it and I like wasn't supposed to do this. I invited a couple friends. <laughs> Fun! And uh, we did not know what to expect because there was no trailer. I don't even know if I saw a poster. Oh, I probably saw a poster. But we were sitting there and I think we thought it was kind of like a family movie. And I remember the part, I guess, spoiler alert, if you for some reason have not seen Pan's Labyrinth in 2022. But the scene where the captain takes that bottle and smashes that guy's face in, I remember yeah. it was so visceral. Like we all y- shouted in the theater because wow. it was just us. I wouldn't have done it if there were other people there. But because we we're so shocked that like we thought this was like a different kind of, of movie. Yeah. Well, I think we should just talk about. You know where we should start? Where? James Whale. Yeah. Let's start at James Whale. Go for it. L- let me ask you, Jackie. Are <laughs> are you a fan at all of the the Universal monster movies of the 30s and 40s? Not really. They're not. You're not. They're not scary it's by not today's standards. It's not because they're scary. Maybe it's just because I never like. Have you seen any of them? Not really. Wait, are you serious? Yeah. You haven't seen Frankenstein or Bride of Frankenstein or Dracula like, with Bela Lugosi. Here's the thing: like you see those, so, like you see so many clips from those movies that you feel like you've already seen the movie. That is the worst excuse I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> They're just not my thing. But wait, how would you know if you haven't seen them? <laughs> <laughs> I've wait, seen you... enough footage from the millions of times no. I've written the Universal Studio Tour, okay? That's not the prime condition to see clips from a movie, in all honesty. But look, <laughs> look, look, look. Wait, so you haven't seen like Creature from the Black Lagoon or The Wolfman or The Mummy, or The Invisible Man? You haven't seen any of those? No. <laughs> Jackie, that's a key corner of film history that you really have to uh, bop your head into. But look. I just never got around to it. So James Whale, really, really fascinating director. Obviously, the, the Universal Monster movie started in the early 30s with the advent of the sound film. And because of that, some of them, like Dracula, honestly, the one with Bela Lugosi, is a little stagey because they don't quite know what to do with the sound. But made the same year, Frankenstein comes out by James Whale. And not to put down Todd Browning, who did Dracula, because obviously he went on to do Freaks and stuff, but James Whale comes on and Frankenstein is a legitimate masterpiece. Like James Whale is head and shoulders above the other universal horror directors of that time. And there's a magic to his movies. He also did the sequel, Bride of Frankenstein. He did The Invisible Man. And there's a magic to his touch. Uh, Of course, he was like gay, working in the studio system in the 30s. They made a movie about him. It's called Gods and Monsters, where Brendan Fraser played him. Wait, 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 wait. Brendan Fraser plays the gardener. Ian McKellen plays him. And Brendan Fraser's like his gardener. But uh, yeah, really fascinating figure. And if you have not seen, he also did The Old Dark House. Have you seen that one? No. Oh, Jackie. <laughs> okay. I guess I have Look, a lot of homework. Go watch. Okay. If you see one, watch the original Frankenstein, which ties directly into this film. You know what? I'll watch it tonight. You will be surprised how beautifully it's put together. Like, it is a film, it is not a cheap piece of entertainment. It is a proper film. Listen, if I had more time, I was going to watch it before this episode, but it's just been a really, really, really crazy weekend slash week. So you saw. Because when we work together, I lent you Bram Stoker's Dracula, the Coppola version. So yes. you saw that before you saw the the Bela Lugosi one. What does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> so you couldn't see all the ways in which that was like subverting I the original see a problem movie. Here. Oh boy. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it's it's appropriate that they picked Frankenstein. It's funny also because I interviewed my grandpa maybe like 10 years before he passed away, just about his life story. And one of the the pieces that was unprompted from him was that during the time, like World War II, the dawn of World War II, the local theater was showing like a couple Frankenstein movies. So my grandpa, as a kid, probably like an eight-year-old, goes to the theater and sees like several Frankenstein movies Aww. and then was so affected by them that like he would imagine that the monster was like creeping up his like stairs at night and stuff like that. That's so, so sweet. They, it affected him too, yeah. There's something about the Frankenstein I monster that. I think that's that's more terrifying than Dracula or the Wolfman or something because it's it, it's reanimated flesh and it's also just like really really sad. Yeah. So without giving getting too di- deep into the Universal monster movies, I just want to give a shout out to Kenneth Branagh's 
adaptation of I've seen Frankenstein. That. Oh, that's right. You like it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, people like hate that movie where Robert De Niro yeah, plays Robert the monster. It's good. It's good. I put off seeing that for so long. Anyway, that's like we can get back onto Spirit of the Beehive now. Um, let's talk about the this all too mellow household and how effective silence there is a whole scene there's a whole meal where no one says a word the whole family is around the table and it's all unsaid and they're they don't appear in the same shot throughout that whole meal it's all singles there's no establishing shot even um it's a household where everyone lives in their own world each parent seems haunted. Like they seem like they're the shell of the people they were before. Yeah. Which is, it's heartbreaking. Like, okay, you have the dad, right? And he, he just seems like he's unhappy. And like what beekeeping is like his hobby, heavy reading, beekeeping, mushroom hunting. I feel like he's just trying to distract himself. I feel like he's rich and that's like his family home. And he just distracts himself with things like this. Um, but there's like this I love his mystery sweater. about him. I love his sweaters. I love his study. Like, who is the when he's writing in his journal about his glass beehive? Who is the someone? I don't know. The someone to whom I showed my glass beehive. Like, it's things like that. It's like this mystery behind them. Of course, the mom has so much. I mean, I, I, but you know what? We start with like a scene of her writing that letter, right? And I love how it's it. Everyone online thinks that it's her lover it's you, it could be anyone if you re, if you listen to the actual letter it's not necessarily to a lover it's just to a loved one when we did this for the film club the general consensus was that it was a lover but then so here's what but I you're love. right it's not explicitly here's stated. what i love though it, she writes that letter right and then you have her dropping it off on the train first of all so cool second of all yeah, can we go back to that yeah, of course. But here's here's what I love so much is she's dropping it in the little mail slot and then she looks in the window and there's this soldier staring at her. And I feel like it's a ghost. Like if we're going to go with like the lover route, I think that's just a ghost because no one else is in uniform. The war is over at this point, by the way. I'm raising my hand in favor. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a ghost. If you can put a ghost in something, then yes, put a fucking ghost in something. More ghosts. In and movies. it's just the way that they have that long eye contact. It must be. It must be. It's really dangerously sexual when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, I'm um, just kidding. And then this is course... a very unerotic movie. Yeah. Well, rightfully so. Yeah. It's sensual, but not erotic. <laughs> of course. I, I agree. And then what about when. Anna finds that photo of her and she had signed it. It says to my dear misanthrope. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Like who is the is that was that for the dad? Was that for the other man? I don't, I don't know. know. I love it. I love the mystery. And then if we think about the mom and dad's relationship, it isn't great. There's that amazing scene where she pretends like she's asleep. Yeah, and it holds on it too. Oh my god, incredible. A lesser film, it would just be like he would come into the room late after he's been working. You would see her eyes open and she'd close them and that would be the end of the yeah, scene. No, but it, it holds. holds. Yeah. It holds. You hear him getting ready for bed. And, you know, but then you have that really tender moment at the end when she takes off his glasses and she puts a yes, jacket yes. on him. I, I just love it. I love that it's not cut and dry, but I love how it's definitely such a empty household. The general air of the house is that there's no one around. Do you think it's possible to take someone's glasses off without waking them up? I don't know. <laughs> I thought that was I've often me. wondered that. Has anyone ever taken your glasses off without waking well, you up? I'm like weird about I never fall asleep with my glasses on. So I know. It's never happened. <laughs> it's never happened to me either. <laughs> no, yeah, the, the the movie is very still, it's very quiet. And uh I love even too in the beginning, like the, the sequences of Anna in school. Oh, I love it, those. It's too. a nice touch. First of all, I love that the teacher is like a genuinely yeah. nice teacher and like seems to enjoy her job. She's Not like 400 I feel like, blows. Yeah, 400 <laughs> blows. So many of these movies, the teachers are like miserable and like hate the kids. Uh, but I love that her organ or her thing that she has to pin on this on this like statue, this uh, Don Jose, <laughs> is the is the eyes. Right. It's the eyes. It's so interesting. That though, wasn't an accident. I feel like it. It was like it's the closest thing to the brain, right? And there was no like brain option. Yeah. 
But I think going back to just like how sad their household is, I mean. Well, here's the, uh, you know what? I don't see it as being like overtly sad. It's just very still. It's it's kind of peaceful. I didn't get the sense that anyone was truly miserable, I think. Uh, mom is the mom is the sad. most, the, the mom seems, seems sad. pretty sad too. These are people who have lost a war. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I get that. I think the dad though has a little bit. I, he said, "You get the sense that he's writing something important." And I don't know. That seems like how I would spend my days as a middle-aged man. And is you like know, foraging and yeah, you know, the like, portrait behind him is of Saint keeping. Jerome. Who oh was yeah, like a yeah. Writer and uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So he's uh, yeah. And but I love when mom is writing the letter, and I love the line where it says. Something tells me perhaps our ability to really feel life has vanished along with the rest. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's just like, I feel like a major theme of this movie is like isolation and loss. And the household, I feel like just perfectly encapsulates that, encapsulates. Yeah. The house is kind of like a womb too. It really is. And I love how it's a real house. There's that amber glow. Obviously they, the go, window, they make it yeah. very explicit that, you know, you have a honeycomb pattern of, yeah. on the window and there's yeah. the amber hue coming in. Of uh, um, did you know that the dad was listening to that? You know when he puts those headphones on? Yeah. He's listening to the BBC. That's like a shortwave radio and he is like illegally listening to BBC. Oh. I didn't so it's like all these hidden things to show like, like the war basically is just like kind of hidden in. Like mom, that letter that she writes is to the Red Cross camp, a Red Cross camp in France, which is where a lot of refugees went. Um, And you can kind of, I didn't notice it. I read that online and then I went and rewatched it. And yeah, when she throws it in the fire. Also, is it returned to her? Was it like a return to sender kind of thing? I don't know. Yeah. And then one of the photos that Anna is looking at is her father with this, like, he was like, it's photoshopped in, like him with this intellectual, like leftist intellectual. So it's, it's things like that. It's the way it's like, but there was no Photoshop back then. (laughs) (laughs) Well, then how did they do that? How did they put the actor with? It's magic. The guy. It's He's magic. a famous scholar. His name is <laughs> Miguel Unamuno. He's a famous scholar who was part of the rebellion. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. Again, uh, this is the result of ping pong, the way that uh, these last few movies have had a lot in common with each other. And we're so pulling weird? from two different parts of the list. But yeah. this film has a lot with in common with Fanny and Alexander, which we just did a couple weeks ago. Fanny and um, Alexander and Mirror. And Mirror, sure. But more so with Fanny and Alexander. And I think so much of this movie, again, just like Fanny and Alexander, is the uh, the world through the eyes of a child and the yes. wonder and, and the, the, the mystery and the danger mm-hmm. of a big, mysterious world. Of course. And you know what? Honestly, similar to housekeeping. Because I think that... Remember when we were doing housekeeping and we talked about these situations where something could go terribly wrong yeah. and then it doesn't? Like, that's that's what's happening in this movie. Well, let's talk about one of those moments that's... that cat, every, I forgot I it happened. I forgot it happened. Which one are you talking it about? It surprised me the second time even. was is uh, Isabel with the cat. Holy shit. <laughs> First of all, I'm not okay with that because it looks... They obviously did like kind of she's choking him right yes. at first i'm like oh it's sweet like she's rubbing her face up against him <laughs> it's creepy and it's it's this very eerie version of childhood which i feel like yes fanny and alexander does as well um well it's like i guess my version of that as a kid was i remember we used to go around the garden and we would collect snails like after yeah, it rained salt. and we'd put them in a bucket and yeah we would sometimes <laughs> Not Kids just salt. Do weird stuff. We would do salt, and then sometimes we would take scissors and cut off the uh, the eyes. Aw, that's you no, know, but that's what I'm saying. It's not just because of the war, right? You right. know, it's yeah. Kids it's have a choosing, dark side, exactly. But this movie is just choosing to concentrate right. on that dark side. Of course, because it is in the bigger picture about like this country and the aftermath yeah. of so much violence. What the war will do, to, yeah, exactly. exactly. It's the way that it shows Anna and Isabel both embracing this really dark side. Um, yeah, the, okay, like the mushrooms. Yeah. And that reminded me of housekeeping a little bit, you know, like introducing this dangerous element. I thought it was going to come back, but it's Phantom it Thread, yeah. Phantom Thread, exactly. Yeah, because there's a fairy tale. There, there's something about poisonous mushrooms and yeah. stuff that, that's like a fairy tale. <laughs> well, it does come back because she has a mushroom later on. Yeah, does it? Which, I, when? So when she's run away and she's in the woods. I know she, doesn't she just look down and there's one there? Well, yeah, and then it cuts, so it, it leaves it open to interpretation. You think she ate one? I think she eats oh. it. And I think she hallucinates the monster. <gasps> 
And that's why when she gets home, she's sick. And like yes. the doctor comes like, oh, she has to have like, you know, easy to digest foods and all this stuff. Oh. I, I think it's because she had a bad mushroom. Totally. She went I on never a trip. caught that. Totally. I agree. Um, the train track is another really like dark kind of thing. Yeah. And like could go very wrong, but doesn't. Okay, how about after Isabel has choked the cat and she like puts blood on her lips? Oh, yeah. It's really, I mean, <laughs> it's arresting. I mean, it's her own blood, but yeah. I know. What? A, okay, pretending to be dead. It's so sad because me and my sister used to do that to my brother. I mean, who didn't do that? <laughs> That's like the classic move. It's a classic. And of course, like you can see her breathing. And I don't know if that was, I don't know if that was a conscious choice. It's just. Yeah. And then, okay, what about all those girls jumping over that huge flame with okay. their skirts, their long ass skirts? There's no way none of them caught on fire. Okay. There's no way. So that's another instance of like, uh, it kind of makes me detest some of the choices made while they were making this movie. Because Oof. the cat, obviously, they kind of had to actually ruffle this cat's feathers because no cat makes that face voluntarily. And then you have the kids jumping over the fire. And again, this is pre-CG and stuff. And these kids are actually... Like the flames right? are licking their they feet are. and their legs and they yeah, their are. dresses. And it, that seems really unsafe. And I'm really sure they had people unsafe. there with it with, ready to put them out. But it's still, I kind of detest that he put children in that situation to begin with. It's pretty crazy. It really is. Like, why did the fire need to be that large? Why did their skirts need to be that long? I know. Or come up with something else where you're not actually putting the kids in danger. I agree. What's so interesting to me, though, is that the monster is never like he's never just horrifying no she's in fact she's not she's afraid of him yeah by she's him. fascinated she keeps summoning him or wanting to summon him the yeah. one scene of the movie we see like we really see is the scene of him and the girl at the lake and then of course we see the girl dead but it's that scene at the lake which is really peaceful and yeah and Wait, Isabel, almost, did you have that as a kid? Did you, was there what? something? I mean, I, something I, that scared me, but also fascinated yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Um, you go first. You know what it was for me? It was Bigfoot. Hmm. It was Bigfoot, and it was the old woman in the bathtub from The Shining because <laughs> I saw it too young. I was terrified of Bloody Mary. Wasn't fascinated. Didn't want anything to do with her. Well, was there one where you were like fascinated? I mm. guess. I loved E.T. I always like loved and was afraid of E.T. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that it's like that, you know? It's it's not just a little girl discovering death. It's it's this duality of people. It's it's being drawn to danger. Yeah. I really do love that they make the narrative choice to put an actual guy in that I abandoned love it farmhouse. Too. It's just a nice little touch. He's not in the movie for long, but like it sets up a nice little thing. And in her mind, that is the monster. Yeah. And the spirit, really. The spirit, exactly. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's a nice touch. And then when he gets gunned down, what a great way to do it. The fact that it's like the camera's on the other side of the field and you just see muzzle flashes and you just hear like guns going off. Yeah. Just what an elegant way to, to do that. I know. And it's so interesting because we think about Pan's Labyrinth and Pan's Labyrinth is like so violent because he could, you know, like that, like these directors couldn't, do that well, back then oh yeah. not in spain i guess well because sure? of the censor yeah but well was doing some crazy shit not in spain he left for the civil war yeah but when he came back after the civil war okay that's true so it's like in in one way it's like i wonder if he was able to would it have been more violent but i don't know yeah and it's such a contrast to pan's labyrinth which is really hard to watch honestly pan's labyrinth because of the violence? Yeah, it's so blood. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> no, no reason. No, it is. It's it's heavy. Men are so annoying. <laughs> the more violence, the better. No, I'm not one of those people. Unless it's like, you know, Evil Dead 2, which is what I was talking about earlier. <laughs> like, if it's a comedy, if it's not taking itself seriously, I want blood to just cover the screen. But Why? I never understood that. Why? Because it's so, it's, it's all in good fun. But. When you have a serious grounded story, I don't like seeing violence. Like, you're supposed to feel it. You're not supposed to be like, oh, yeah, give me more. The only time I've ever been like, give me more is like, yeah, for like fun splatter, like horror movies or like 
the the Peter Jackson movie Dead Alive or something like that. But like those are yeah, I'm, I'm not one of those like typical, um, you know, I'm not some gore hound. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, some other references I realized like in Pan's Labyrinth to this. What? Like uh, the general in this one when he's shaving, it's very similar to the captain in Pan's Labyrinth. Like he has a whole shaving scene. Too. Oh yeah, yeah. And also the clock, the pocket watch. Yeah, and they're talking talking about the how precise it is and the yeah. gears and all that stuff. Well, yeah. okay, with that, let's talk about this glass beehive. Okay. Because I love this motif. You know what's funny? When they say glass beehive, I expected something that looked a little cooler than that. <laughs> it's literally just a just glass, glass box. Walls. Yeah. Uh, but I love that, like, and I don't know, <laughs> I don't know that much about beekeeping besides my friend, uh, my friend's mom used to keep bees and I was over his house once. And uh, I think we had just picked up some like Taco Bell or something and we're like sitting in his backyard and the bees always would just keep to themselves. And this one day, (laughs) this one bee just flew right up to me while I was eating Taco Bell and stung me right in my arm. And then because it was a bee, its stinger was stuck in my arm and it was dying, but it kept trying to sting me with its butt that was now missing a stinger. And I like ran away. I dropped my Taco Bell on the ground. (laughs) And then I went to the the front yard and the bee followed me over there and was still trying to sting me. As he's dying? As it was dying. Wow. Um, So that's all I know about beekeeping. But I love that like mesh tube that like the bees in there. Yeah, that was cool. I don't know if that's like a thing that people do or not, but yeah. Must be. Yeah, the whole thing just has a very like womb organic like feel to it. Womb organic, but then he also gets into that. Like in his diary, what he's writing about the mechanics of it. Right. I love the, like the wording is actually beautiful. Here are just some like snippets of it I love. Uh, Like you said, the main gear wheel of a clock, constant agitation of the honeycomb, (laughs) mysterious maddened commotion, endlessly varied and repetitive labors of the swarm. He's a poet. He is the relentless yet ineffectual toil fevered comings and goings uh this is my favorite (laughs) final repose of death in a place that tolerates neither sickness nor tombs like it i feel like yeah okay it's probably a symbol for fascism but it's also just the world yeah it's man right no he's a smart guy beautifully put i think when I get to his age, I kind of want to be like him, except in a slightly happier, like a happier too. household. You know, <laughs> me too. I look me at too. him, and I also look at Michael Stuhlbarg from Call Me by Your Name. As like, yes, I want to become them. Oh my later goodness! In life. Yes. yes. Did you know that the title of the movie is actually taken from a book about bees? No. Which was Ari says favorite book about beekeeping. He said that. The spirit of the beehive, like what the actual spirit of the beehive beehive is, um, to name the powerful, enigmatic, and paradoxical force that the bees seem to obey and that the reason of man has never come to understand. Like the author of that book described the spirit as that. Wow. I know. It's It's really powerful. The name is really great. Like this is a great title for a movie. (laughs) It really is. And yeah, it's it's just the look of the movie too. It's just yeah, it's just it's very patient. It's very like I love all the amber hues. I love the way that scenes kind of unfold slowly. I love someone on Letterbox said like ASMR totally. Like there's a oh, yeah. there's a sense of just like tactility and Oh yeah. Uh, I yeah. love um this one moment where the girls are talking in their bedroom and we don't see them at all. It's first it's a shot of like the painting that's above their nightstand. And then, or no, first it's them doing uh, hand puppets on the walls, but they're having a conversation. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And then it's the painting. And then an, the first time they talk right before she tells her about the spirit, it's that really long shot of just the candle that hasn't been lit. She's like, where are the matches? And then she lights it. I Yeah. Yes. It's atmospheric. It's very atmospheric. It's dripping with atmosphere. It really is. <laughs> Ethereal. Yeah. <laughs> We've used that word a lot for the last couple of movies, but they've all been, that's been the case. I know, right? Should we do sight and sound? Yeah, wow, let's do it. Speaking of sound. Speaking of sound, let's do sight and sound. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is your favorite sight from this movie? Okay. Mine is the shot of the mom. I think we have the same one. <laughs> the shot of the mom. 
on her bike trying to make it to the train because it's this really long shot and you see the train in the background and it was just timed perfectly like the way that they set it up was perfect you see the train coming in the back and then she just like she parks her bike she walks over by the time she gets to the rails like the train is pulling up and it's all one shot and it's really beautiful it is beautiful wait why did you think we had we had the because same you one? said can we get back to that train oh i meant can we go back to that as a society like oh. the mail in the train <laughs> oh well i'm pretty sure that's just because they lived in such a remote village yeah, do you want to live in a remote I village do. yes i do with really and the only movie theater is sometimes movie theater that comes and you have to go to town hall and take your own chair you want that yeah but this is the 21st century i can you know i can bring all my <laughs> blu-rays <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite site my favorite site it was close it was kind of between two but i went with one uh it's it is that shot when the girls light the candle yes and they're each in their beds and it's this long shot in the middle is the the dresser with the candle on it and they start talking about the movie this is the night yeah. after they've seen frankenstein for the first time and anna says to isabel something like what why did they why did the why did he kill that girl why did they yeah. kill them like tell you said you would tell me and i just love the that half awake, like Isabel has her eyes closed. She's like, I'll tell you later. And then it's like, no, no, you're a liar. Yeah. She's yeah. like, you're a liar. You don't know. Like who can't relate to that? I and, know. Uh, it's so cute. And just kids up and late how, at night yeah. and just talking about a movie they just saw. And very, the cute. wonder of the world. Very you know? heartwarming. When, you know, and when Isabel does say like, I, I've seen him. Like yeah. I've seen him around. <laughs> and she could be like, she's telling the truth. Yeah. To a kid. Yeah, for a kid, and she's I, telling the truth. And I love that it's so simple. It's like, it's a kid who literally can't understand why they killed the monster. Like, how pure is that? Yeah. Well, and why the monster he killed is, the girl. You would know if you'd seen the movie. <laughs> but he does kill but, the girl in the movie. Exactly. It's an accident, though. It's an accident. Oh, it's like a of mice and men sort of yes, situation. Yes, exactly. Well, mice spoiler, and men. thanks for telling me. Listen, Jackie, this movie is like 90 <laughs> years, 90 years old at this point, okay? <laughs> Uh, it's funny going about. I I do think Isabel kind of believes it, and I think it goes back to the fact, that, like very brief story time. Uh, <laughs> when we were kids, my younger sister picked up a phone. Okay, like there's just a phone on a receiver. She picks it up, and I'm sitting there with her, and she's like, "Uh huh, uh huh," like she's talking to someone. And I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> and she's like, "Uh, oh, okay." And she hangs up the phone, and I was like, "What just happened?" And she was like, "Some guy just told me the story of Winnie the Pooh." <laughs> and I believed her. And you know what? I think she fucking believed it too in that moment. <laughs> oh my gosh. This Wait. isn't like a kid's toy phone. It's like a yeah. regular phone. Is your sister older than you? No, she's younger. Oh my god! <laughs> but I, I bought it. I was like, That's whoa, really? So and then I funny. picked it up and it was just a dial tone. That is hilarious. And I, th I thought she just got lucky or something. <laughs> <laughs> that she was told the story of Winnie the Pooh by a total stranger. Yeah. Hey, how weird! I mentioned Winnie the Pooh at the start of this episode. Yeah. Well, <laughs> honey, you know you have has honey in common. What's your favorite sound? So my favorite sound is when we see Fernando. I think it's the introduction to him, and he's beekeeping, and he opens up his pocket watch, and it plays that oh, little tune. Yeah, so Here, good. let's hear it. I'm just a sucker for like whimsical music boxes and I stuff. I love that. You know, at first when, when he first did that, I thought I thought maybe he was imagining it. Because I didn't know there were clocks that could play music when sure. you open. I didn't know that. I didn't know there were pocket watches like that. Jackie, there is some wonder left in the world. Is there? I don't know. <laughs> What's your favorite sound? Mine is when Anna grabs the matches out of the drawer. And it's just like the rattling of the matches inside the box <laughs> oh, mixed yeah, with the, the sound of them being lit. I love it. Your, your dripping water, I've realized... Dripping water to you is the sound of flames to me. I think you and I are very like ASMR prone. Yes. Like <laughs> we are. Yeah. Well, this is a segment where we would normally get into Pauline Kale. What? But then, again, I could not find a review. I could not find a Pauline Kale review for this film. I don't know 
that she reviewed it, even though it was released in New York in 1976, yeah. which she was a critic for The New Yorker. But uh, no, could not find a Pauline Kael review for this one. Mm, wow. Well. What do you, do you think she would have liked it? Um, She's such a wild card. She is a wild I card. I truly <laughs> <Yeah>. don't know. <laughs> I think she would. Yeah. But then I also think that she's a woman who needs to be like really wowed. Well, yes and no. What's the last like quiet movie that she liked? <laughs> Uh, Wait, did she, did she like Aguirre, Wrath of God? God, I don't remember. God, I don't remember <laughs> either. <laughs> that was that episode was so long ago. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess she tends to like movies that are a little more Louder, cacophonous. Right? Yeah, yeah, like Altman movies and stuff. Uh, but anyway, that brings us to our lovely letterbox segment where we read letterbox reviews by well-intentioned uh, film reviewers online uh here's one for half a star okay the most boring film i've seen in my life i had to fast forward through the dry moments because it was simply so mundane it was actually painful we're gonna get a lot of these i can tell but i'll give one four and a half star review films about children connecting with film are definitely something that resonates with me that's you greg oh <laughs> <laughs> Half a star, a monument of non-entity. Very rarely has so little been said with so much. Aww. <laughs> it's harsh. Two and a half stars. This is the kind of movie people love to call hypnotic and people that hate it call boring. While there are certainly some striking visuals in this film, especially the final shot, for the most part, put me in the boring camp. I know a Philistine like me should just stick with Michael Bay if I can't appreciate artistic, plotless meandering with an allegorical subtext. I'm sorry. I like a story in my narrative film. Sue me. There is a story, though. I think so, too. But he goes on to say, unlike most films that operate from a kid's point of view, Beehive doesn't sentimentalize childhood or treat it as a parade of traumatic experiences. Instead, the viewer is treated to a singularly haunting and realistic portrayal of the way that children assimilate the concept of death into their imaginations. Okay, my dude, I'm very confused. Did you like it or did you not? Yeah, I don't know. Well, He it's... wrote such a nice thing at the end and then he says, like, I should just stick to Michael Bay. Is he joking? No, he's joking about that part, yes. Oh, okay. I don't think he actually likes Michael Bay. I mean, he sounds like he's conflicted. He sounds like a very sentimental. A I mean, no, I mean, he sounds like a very wise and tender <laughs> person. Someone gave it two and a half stars and said Belfast for older people. <laughs> I thought what? Belfast already was for older people. That's funny. Uh, I shouldn't. I haven't seen it. I shouldn't shit talk. One star. Symbo, symbolic symbolism. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> That's all I got. Well. I've had a lovely 46 weeks with all of you, especially you, Greg. Yeah, but we're not saying goodbye. <laughs> we're coming back. It's just a break. I swear. It's just a month off. So, yes, we'll be back December 6th with Singing in the Rain. And in the meantime, we hope you enjoy the new Arroyo Film Club podcast, Behind the Slate. It's going to be awesome. And this is also a great time to catch up on a few movies that you haven't seen yet. Yeah, go back and listen to our previous episodes that you haven't heard yet, please. Why are you please. laughing? Because when we come back, you guys better have listened to all of Every them. single one. No, this is a journey that we're taking together. We want to all watch the movies on the sight and sound list. So you have some time to catch up. Yeah. And again, if you want to get in touch with us in the meantime, you can find oh, us yeah. email. It's hello at seenandheardpod.com. Also our website, just seenandheardpod.com. Drop us a line. We'd love to hear yeah. from you guys. Please and, get in uh, touch. We'd love to hear how we've been doing this first half and any thoughts or questions. Yeah, yeah. we'd love to talk. Yeah, or if you just want to say, hey, that's fine too. Until then, I'm Greg. I'm Jackie. And we'll see you next time. Happy, Happy Halloween. Halloween. This has been an official podcast of the Arroyo Film Club. Seen and Heard is Jacqueline Pastagian and Greg Kleinschmidt. Theme music by Andrew Cox. You can find us at seenandheardpod.com.